Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. We're heading towards the controversial year of 1619 by analyzing the prior financial challenges and realities faced by a daring and ambitious English enterprise. In 1606, British King James I granted the Virginia Company of London a charter. A year later, this privately funded joint stock company established the first permanent English colony in North America at Jamestown in the colony of Virginia. Historian Misha Ewan recounts the fascinating early history of the Virginia Company and its initial investors. I think for me, the best way of thinking about the colonial project really stems from expanding what we understand to be that participation. And I think there are very proactive ways that people are involved, whether that's as company shareholders or the people who actually migrate and become colonists. But I think understanding that participation in the colonial project to also include people who do it in maybe more fleeting or passive ways. So buying a ticket for the lottery, for example, you know, money which was put to very real use by the company to send settlers to fortify and to expand the colonial project. But I also think about these fleeting examples of the women, for example, who provided lodging and food and washed the clothes of colonists in the weeks and days leading up to their departures and supplied foodstuffs for the ships. And I think through that lens, we get a sense this requires the buy-in and the support of a much broader public. And I think some people would think that's not significant, it's not important, you know, how much did they understand about what they were doing? But I think it almost doesn't matter how much they bought into it personally. The fact is that they helped to make it possible. And without their help and their investment in the various different ways that that happened, the project would not have been successful and the English would not have succeeded in establishing a colony in North America. And I think this is important for how people in Britain today understand its colonial past, because we have tended to think that this is something that a very elite group of men were involved with, and actually other people were not aware, they were not interested, they didn't participate. But I think it kind of forces us to reckon with the fact that this was something that was made possible by ordinary people as well. And how does that change the ways that we think about our colonial past and its legacies for us today? That's what I'm sort of really interested in. Under James I, I think if he had had the money to finance this, I think that what would have developed would have been something more akin to a trading post. I don't think there would have been as much emphasis on settling families and creating permanent communities, these urban settlements with various different industries. I wonder whether it would have been much more focused on male settlers, fortification, militaristic, which is how it was in the beginning. But I think it grew and developed into something else because of the influence of Virginia Company investors. And I think one really good example of that is the creation of the General Assembly in 1618. This House of Assembly gave colonists a hand in governing themselves. And this actually was something that James did not appreciate. And a few years later, when the company was dissolved, he says that he doesn't want to see a company managing colonization again. He doesn't appreciate the political sort of character that colonization had begun to have. Members of the Virginia Company talk about the creation of a new commonwealth. And that term commonwealth has obviously stayed part of the Virginia legacy to this day. But that was a word that had both the meaning of a new state or a polity, but it also had Republican undertones. And I think it's an ongoing debate for scholars. How much did some of these people involved in the company think that they were creating this new kind of Republican state far away from the English crown? And I think we'll probably never agree on that. But I think the direction that it went in, that actually there was much more of a political emphasis on the way that the colony would develop is something that I just don't think would have happened under the direction of the crown. And I think also under the direction of the crown, I don't think we would have seen this expansive participation of people across England like we were just talking to. I think it's a project that would have stayed much more closely entangled with the court. I don't think we would have found examples of people as far flung as Manchester and Bristol getting involved as well. 
I think something that I'm probably bringing to this research is my point of view as a British scholar in Britain. So I sometimes think that my reading of this evidence and my sort of understanding of this history will differ from people in the United States who have grown up with the history of Jamestown and people who live its impacts and its legacies in very different ways to people in Britain. As an example, my own kind of personal connection with this history is that I didn't know anything about it until the final year of my undergraduate degree had no understanding really of English colonisation in Virginia and it took me by surprise and that was really what made me want to study this history more because generally I think a lot of people in Britain are very unfamiliar with it and initially the reason that I started looking at the role of women and the way that the labouring classes were involved in this project was more about my own kind of personal interest in wanting to expand the people that I was researching. I thought, you know, I'm kind of getting a bit bored of reading about these members of parliament and company directors. I want to hear about other people. But I think then it struck me that there was something deeper and more interesting about their involvement, which is how Britain does understand its colonial past. And I think sometimes it conflicts with feminist history, it conflicts with working class history, you know, people that sometimes we've seen as being victims in these narratives of empire as well. And actually, I think what this showed was that these were people who sometimes were pushing back and were resisting the colonial project. So poorer people who did not want to be transported to Virginia because they couldn't find a job in England. But actually, it was interesting that these are people who were upholding it and supporting it just as much as the elite men in the city of London are. And I think it's forced me to look at sources, historical sources in different ways. I've started to see imperial history everywhere in English archives. But even things like sort of towards the end when I was completing this book, I made a visit to a local church in London where there's a memorial to Catherine Huberbock, who was the woman who invested in the company in 1609. And her memorial survives, which is quite remarkable for it to have survived hundreds of years. And I was really interested in her as a woman and someone who was innovative and someone who was clearly independent. But I thought, you know, there's a colonial legacy entangled with this woman and her history and this memorial as well. And what I think is that until we start to surface this history a bit more and to kind of wrap our heads around it and for people to have a greater understanding of it, we can't actually understand our country. And that's in a very kind of physical sense, like these monuments and memorials that we have to different people. But I think we can't understand the debates that are ongoing today about reparative justice and decolonization if we don't actually have all the facts. And the facts are that this wasn't just a minor interest confined to a few people. This was something that actually a whole nation was invested in as well. And I think showing that it is more complex than just good and bad. There were kind of complicated ways that people were involved in this as well. And I just think it's something that we ought to know more about and hopefully my book can make a small contribution to that understanding. I'm Mark Vinette and I hope you're enjoying the ride. 